Um, so I think it, when you sort of just think about lumps and bumps generally, and you say, okay, what's my end goal in this? Um, and the end goal is actually to identify potentially aggressive neoplasm. Um, and, and then what's the, what's the second goal? The second goal is that if we can potentially pick up the benign lesions by an ultrasound, since ultrasound is going to be our first sort of uh, triage uh, uh, instrument, is to minimize uh, further imaging or potentially even uh, further uh, invasive procedures. So I think if you keep those two goals in mind, you, you realize it's not so much about really coming down with a precise diagnosis, but it's a lot to do with uh, trying, a lot to do with uh, trying to find out if it's, uh, it's, it should be something left alone, it's benign, or is it something which needs to be further imaged and, and biopsied. Um, I won't go through the details on ultrasound and its advantages. This is a very highly skilled ultrasound uh, uh, room. Now, uh, unfortunately, when you do a bumpogram ultrasound exam, there is really no getting away from the history and potentially, if possible, a physical exam. Now, the way we practice here, it's a little bit different because the sonographer already does the exam, and, and so many times you're remotely reporting and you don't have access to uh, a physical exam. And so we've trained our sonographers to at least in the, in, the, in the jot pad, in the notepad, put in information about what it looked like. So you, the history you can pick up from the, uh, from the notes, but in terms of physical exam, you need some guidance on what was the firmness, what was the mobility of that lesion, uh, was it tender during the exam? Was there any skin changes? Was there a color change on the skin? Because all this will help you synthesize that information and, and put it into the impression. Uh, in terms of history, it's really important to know, is it a single lesion or are there multiple lesions? How long has this bump been there? Is it like a short time or is it a like long time interval? What's the rate of growth? If the patient says, oh, this has suddenly grown uh, significantly versus, oh, it's not grown for the last three years. You know, that helps us to quickly reach the point of making a diagnosis. Um, is there any history of prior trauma? We saw some excellent images of uh, intramuscular hematoma, and Sherry Tiffy uh, also talked about how it looked like a muscular hematoma, but turned out to be a, a sarcoma. All those issues are there. Is there history of trauma or not? Um, any infection, ongoing infection, to think about abscess and things like that, in the history of anticoagulation um, and things like that. And is there a known malignancy? Because sometimes, and many times, these bumps or lumps could just be metastatic disease. Um, and the ultrasound appearance may be very nonspecific, but now your suspicion is much higher. And even if you're thinking this looks benign, your suspicion is higher, so you might make a diagnosis of malignancy. Very important to choose the right transducer, because the transducers now are really high frequency, up to 18 megahertz, even higher. And the resolution is impeccable. So uh, sometimes sonographers have a tendency of sticking to a nine megahertz, 11 megahertz linear, and they do use that for everything. Even though they have the ability to pick up the high frequency small transducer which is available. And then optimizing the Doppler and, uh, and using extended field of view. Sometimes you want a relationship, how far is the joint from this bump, or how far is this tendon from this bump, and you need some extended field of view or a video clip so that you can make a good judgment. Light touch is again important because uh, you don't want to uh, press hard and uh, kill the vascularity which might be extremely subtle. Now, what are the ultrasound descriptors for a lump? You see a, a lump and in your report, what are some very important specific points you must say so that the orthopedic surgeon or whoever sent you the case understands exactly where that lesion is. So you need to say where, is the, where exactly is it located in terms of anatomy? What's its relationship to the fascia? Is it in it? Is it above it? Is it below it? What's the relationship to the vessels or nerves, especially the, one, the named vessels and nerves which are in proximity? Is it related to them? You have to also uh, comment on uh, its connection with the joint potentially or no connections with the joint. And then, of course, size. In terms of morphology, you use your grayscale and color Doppler to uh, comment on whether it's cystic, solid, is it mixed, what's the shape, borders. 
basically simulating your physical exam impressions into your ultrasound impression. Now, there is a huge list of benign lesions which present as bumps and lumps. And actually, if you ask me as a radiologist and as a clinician, and even as a patient, it is fantastic when you diagnose these because patient comes really concerned of this bump and you say, oh, I'm 100% sure this is a sebaceous cyst. And he's happy and you're happy and your diagnosis is done. And I think in the perfect world, I think that's how medicine should be practiced. You're not giving bad news to anybody else. But <laughs> that's not the case. But going through this list, we have the cyst, bursa, ganglion, all day in and out. You see them, lipomas, vascular malformations, foreign body granulomas, uh, superficial fibromatosis, uh, muscle hernias, and uh, peripheral nerve sheath tumors, a lot of this benign list of lesions. And then in terms of malignant, it's a short list. It is a non-specific list. It is very intervention biopsy-based diagnosis uh, of lymphoma, or you have some soft tissue sarcomas, or potentially a metastatic lesion. Um, as a couple of speakers alluded, there are no very set follow-up guidelines on these lumps and bumps, and sometimes it's sort of a gestalt, you know. Um, if you see a post-traumatic hematoma and you're pretty sure there was trauma, it's a different thing, but sometimes you don't know if trauma got the patient to the hospital, but what you are thinking is a hematoma was a pre-existing situation, and it's bleeding because it's a malignancy. So you have to sort of uh, come up with a little bit of a gestalt. If anything doesn't feel very right, there is really no harm in calling the patient back in three to, three, three to six months and look for temporal evolution of that lesion. This is really the most harmless way to quickly see if there's anything that changes in a short period of time. So in terms of ultrasound pattern, and uh, it's, it's critical to identify the layers, and I think it's really critical to train the sonographers on identifying these layers. The skin is generally uh, echogenic. You can see on this image, there's a little bit of a gel on the top just to differentiate that dermis layer from, uh, from everything else and to create an acoustic window. Then below that, you have the subcutaneous fat, which is somewhat slightly hypoechoic, extremely variable in thickness. And then you have the muscles, which have these medium level echoes. This is a transverse image. In a longitudinal image, it's more of a lamellar pattern. And then the fascia, the intervening fascia, is hyperechoic and maintains its, uh, its appearance all through. Um, the resolution has really reached the point where you can see these fascias extremely well. So taking an example of the abdominal wall itself to understand a little bit of the anatomy, you quickly look at the understanding, okay, if this is the skin, and if this is the subcute fat, then in the abdominal wall, this is the rectus muscle. Then you have these three muscles on the side. You have the semilunaris layer here, the external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse. The other thing, uh, and even if there is a lesion in any one of these layers, is to simulate a, a dynamic maneuver. What happens when the patient does something? So in this instance, the patient contracts the abdominal wall, and you can see that the internal oblique sort of just becomes much more uh, uh, visible and round in its appearance. And you know, all these little maneuvers help you understand what the layers are. This is a midline transverse image uh, showing the two rectus muscles in the abdominal wall. And this is the linea alba right in the middle. And this layer just below that many times uh, is mistaken for some sort of a lipoma or tumor, but just properitoneal fat. And here again is the uh, more lateral line, which is uh, between the oblique muscles and the rectus, which is the linea uh, semilunaris. Here's a little video to show you how uh, in contraction in live you can see these, and if you want to diagnose a hernia, you want to diagnose any sort of uh, uh, muscle hernia itself or a hernia coming from the peritoneal cavity, it's really important to get those maneuvers right. This is a groin hernia here. Very obviously there is a break there, and you can see herniation of the uh, mostly fatty contents and no bowel in there. So even though you might have a very clear bumpogram image, I think it's really important to have some video clips in terms of dynamic maneuvers which were done to illustrate what are the relationships of the anatomy uh, when you are trying to decide where exactly uh, a certain uh, lesion is located. So continuing with the relationship of layers, if you look at this layer, this is in the lower abdominal wall um, and palpable lesion. So you know that this is the, the skin, the subcute fat, and then you have the fascia, so this lesion is obviously very well located uh, 
within the muscle itself. And you can see the peritoneal layer at the bottom. Comparing that with this lesion, you can see again it's a bumpogram. You have the skin, you have the subcute fat, you're down to the muscle. This is a lesion in the muscle, but if you look very carefully at the bottom, it is actually going through the peritoneum into the intraperitoneal component also. So it's very important to define where exactly the lesion is and what is its relationship with the fascias around it because it completely changes your approach based on its local infiltrative uh, pattern. Um, this is a case from Sherry Tiffy from my work at Malincrot, and this is a beautiful case of muscle hernia. There's an uh, interrupted fascia over there, and you can see patient has to contract, and only then you will see it. And that's the other thing. In many of these bumpograms, you know, they may not be visible when patients are lying supine in the examination room. You have to simulate the maneuver that makes that uh, bump really obvious. Now, this is the commonest thing you see. You see a lot of these epidermal inclusion cysts. And in a perfect world, this is how you would see it. You would see it very well defined. You will see a very nice anechoic cystic uh, cavity, which is having a tract that leads up to the skin. Now, this tract is there many times. But if you increase the transducer pressure a little bit, then it sort of disappears. So it's critical to sort of uh, find that tract, and then you know you've, your diagnosis is, is done. Also look behind the lesion. A cyst has extreme uh, through transmission over there. So it tells you that's a cystic lesion. Now, when you do high-resolution ultrasound, you can really have very good understanding of the dermal attachment in a, in a epidermoid, in a cyst, uh, in a sebaceous cyst. And so it's important to use that and see what's happening. There's this study which talked about a clear delineation of the dermal attachment, and then there is this little focal dermal protrusion, even if the track is not there, to clearly say that this is most likely a sebaceous cyst. Now, when you put color Doppler, the, uh, the sonographers are very tempted to pick up these little vascularities in there, which is nothing but you know, the debris and the junk and, and the cholesterol crystals. They will give little twinkle artifacts. If you put a spectral Doppler on that, it's not going to translate to any, any important signal. But on the color Doppler, these little things will sometimes make you think that this is, uh, this is real color in this vessel, which is not the case. So be careful of that uh, pitfall. Here's a um, sebaceous cyst with ruptured. Once they rupture, they're a little bit more difficult. Patient comes with painful symptoms. And this uh, cyst has ruptured. Here you can see some uh, a track also moving up to the, uh, to the, through the skin. Now, the track may not be absolutely well aligned because once it ruptures, it gets really oblique. So it's kind of important to sort of scan through and find the track itself. There might be some focal inflammation around a ruptured cyst. So you can see a heterogeneous hyperechoic appearance of the um, the fat surrounding the cyst. Now, in this case, you can see that this lesion is located under the skin in the subcute fat above the muscle fascia, very well defined, but doesn't show really good through transmission. And at the same time, you can't see any obvious track, at least not in these two images which I'm showing you. So the, that relationship of layers becomes really important. This is a case of fat necrosis, as was this case of fat necrosis. A fat necrosis is a very uh, difficult diagnosis unless you sort of correlate it with the symptoms patients are having. Most of the time, they are somewhat tender. But in terms of echogenicity, they can vary from being hyperechoic to hypoechoic or extremely heterogeneous. In this instance, we had the benefit of the CT, but on ultrasound, it was somewhat atypical appearance with, uh, with sort of a fluid level over there. But generally, this is more likely fat necrosis, which you see corresponding to patient's area of pain. And there is this little heterogeneous area, small hypoechoic areas within it. In this case, this is a much bigger portion of fat necrosis. You can see very mottled fat with a lot of diffuse shadowing. Sometimes you can pick up a little bit increased vascularity. But you can see there's a lot of variation. And that's why the clinical background becomes really important before making the diagnosis. And if you are in doubt, it just ask for a follow-up, see what happens in three weeks. And uh, if the patient is appropriately treated, the pain goes down and the fat necrosis sort of blends more with the fat itself. Here's another case of fat necrosis. It seemed like a mass on the MRI. We did the ultrasound and uh, looked like that heterogeneous area with small hypoechoic nidus in the middle. This was biopsied and even the pathologist uh, came up with fat necrosis site. Um, continuing with the relationship with layers, uh, we see tons of lipomas, most of the time subcute uh, plane or sometimes in the intramuscular planes also. Again, great demonstration that this is located within the subcute fat itself. 
The problem happens when you have a very large lipoma. I think once you go about five centimeters, it's really difficult for ultrasound to really conclusively say this is completely benign because there can be eccentric areas which either you're not seeing or you are not comprehensively evaluating. So once they're really large, it almost makes sense sometimes to get a baseline MRI exam. In this lipoma, there was some heterogeneous area eccentrically placed here. There's another eccentrically uh, uh, atypical sort of place there. There's another one fairly large, and you can realize that we are limited uh, a lot. There's a lot of attenuation taking place, so it limits the proper evaluation of this lipoma. So then that lipoma in a well-differentiated liposarcoma is, is the key, like are you going to miss a well-differentiated liposarcoma? And there's this paper from Radiographics from 2005 which has a couple of hints which might help. One, that almost 50% of these liposarcomas are lesions that occur in the lower extremity, particularly in the thigh. So if you sort of come across this sort of a large lesion and it is in that location, um, you would be more suspicious than, for example, elsewhere. And then almost one third of these lesions are actually in the retroperitoneum, which happens to be the second most common location. Now, this is not the patient who's gonna present with a bumpogram, but that is the second most location. So once you are gone beyond the proximal uh, thigh area and the retroperitoneum, then you have the other areas where you might find in head or neck. So the further you go away from the retroperitoneum and the proximal lower extremity, the lesser is the chance that you might be dealing with a well-differentiated liposarcoma. Having said that, the fact that uh, if the lesion is big enough and you feel you have not fully conclusively evaluated, I do think an MR as a baseline is recommended. Here's another case. This was uh, sort of in the, uh, in the thigh and encroaching into the pelvis. We could see some vascularity. We could see an eccentric uh, heterogeneous hypoechoic area. This did, uh, a biopsy was performed in this area, and this did come out as liposarcoma. Continuing with the relationship to adjoining structures, uh, you look for uh, a relationship to tendons, you look, at, look for a relationship to uh, nerves. In this instance, there was this uh, bump uh, very closely associated with one of the tendons in the foot. And when you do dynamic maneuver of the tendon, the tendon was moving back and forth, but the lesion itself was not moving. That uh, almost implied that this was in the sheath itself, and on biopsy was one of the giant cell tumors of the tendon sheath. Continuing with the relationship to adjoining structures, this was a very interesting irregularly marginated lesion around the radial artery. I actually thought this must be uh, lymphoma, the way it was sort of encasing it, but not really uh, infiltrating the artery itself. But again, once you start dealing with lesions which are having a very non-specific appearance, they're not fitting in any compartment, you know the next step is going to be a biopsy. Um, the MR also showed an enhancing lesion, so we underwent a biopsy, and when I was a little bit surprised, it did come as nodular fasciitis on the pathology. The neuromas, you know, this is a Morton's neuroma between the uh, interdigital web space in the foot, and if you really try hard, you can sometimes find an entering and an exiting vessel. It's not as easy as it seems when you read in textbooks. It uh, requires a lot of maneuvers uh, and uh, sometimes pressure between the inter-digital uh, web space from the plantar aspect or from the, uh, from the top to try and make it visible. Most of the peripheral nerve sheet tumors uh, will be hypoechoic. They will show some sort of a through transmission, and because they show the through transmission, they can be uh, mistaken for a cyst. Uh, Blood flow is a little bit difficult to uh, demonstrate unless uh, you are able to have a very light touch and uh, set up the parameters very well. But I think the key is to looking for a peripheral nerve continuity and your anatomy that is that the expected location for one of the uh, known peripheral nerves. Here's a couple of examples. At least in this one, you could see that there's a nice entering nerve, a little bit of a peak on the uh, cephalic portion and a little bit of a peak in the caudal portion telling you an entering nerve and an exiting nerve, which would be seen with a, neuro with a neuroma. So then, once you are gone with these benign lesions and you've finished your uh, understanding of its relationship with the nearby anatomy, you are left with multiple sorts of non-specific lesions which invariably will end up uh, being diagnosed based on a biopsy. These could be metastatic or malignant lesions. So a few examples about that. Here's a, a lesion very clearly within the muscle here. You can see that skin, that's acute fat. This is a muscle. It's very heterogeneous here. Uh, 
But on, on, on Doppler, you can see intense vascularity. It's very irregularly lobulated, and uh, this turned out to be a metastatic lesion. Now, here's uh, uh, another case in which you have a hypoechoic mass in the region of the hip. And interestingly, initially, we thought that this might be a cyst or a chronic hematoma. This is the skin. That's the subcute fat. This is the uh, muscle. But on uh, color Doppler, the uh, tech was able to convincingly show arterial flow within this hypoechoic lesion. So this was obviously lymphoma on biopsy. So unless you use all the tools available for you, it can really masquerade as a benign lesion. Here's another large uh, uh, diffuse B-cell lymphoma, fairly large, encasing the vessels, and obviously biopsied on ultrasound. Desmoid-type fibromatosis is the other one. Uh, seen a few of those uh, a little bit more frequently than we should, uh, sort of locally invasive lesion, and again, uh, mostly diagnosed by doing a biopsy. Now, here was an interesting lesion. This was a mass overlying the patella, and initially we looked at the underlying tendon, and the tendon was not involved, which was uh, interesting. We did the maneuvers, and it was moving really well. This is the infrapatellar tendon here on the transverse plane, and there was a very good cleavage between the lesion itself and the patella, uh, patellar tendon. So obviously it was not originated from that. I thought maybe some kind of bursa, but nevertheless we went ahead and uh, biopsied this. This is the MR characteristics of this lesion, and it can, turned out to be a basaloid epithelial neoplasm. So that does tell you that once you are dealing with lesions which are not falling in very typical pattern, you are going to uh, end up doing a biopsy to make a more specific diagnosis. Uh, some more cases, this was a iliosoas region mass. Actually, we came to look for the, ilio, uh, with, for the hip area, and then by the time you sort of kept tracing this big uh, myxomatous lesion, it did turn out to be a myxoma. It was actually encroaching along the iliosoas all the way up into the pelvis itself. And this was also biopsied, and this was somewhat of a hard biopsy. There's a lot of cystic areas in these mucoid lesions. Uh, this tells you the extent of this lesion. Okay, another case, this also was an anterior hip mass, and initially I thought this is just a, a, a fluid collection in the bursal space, but uh, this patient, this does not change over a period of time, so we ended up biopsying this, and this also did turn out to be a myxoma. So I think that adage is, is true that with uh, a lot of these uh, masses, if they are not going to follow uh, into a characteristic pattern, and you follow them in three months or three weeks, and you don't see any change, then it's better to actually put a needle and come to know what exactly is going on with these patients. There's one more example of a myxoma. This was a little bit more suspicious just because it had this solid area eccentrically placed over there with a lot of vascularity in it. Okay, here's a patient with, again, very irregular mass uh, on, in the forearm itself, large amount of vascularity seen within it, and was biopsied. This was a porocarcinoma. So you can see where I'm going with this, that, you know, they have all these different ty type of appearances, but there's nothing on ultrasound that is going to help you make a, a strong diagnosis one way or the other. So I think limiting ourselves to knowing, okay, this lesion is, is looking super benign. I'm not going to worry about it. And then once you are in the zone of indeterminate, I think you have to start uh, thinking of biopsying these lumps and bumps. Okay, I'm gonna uh, show this uh, just for completion many times, and we live in Arizona, so we have a lot of cactuses around us. So you see this many times, you know, people come up with a foreign body granuloma with some sort of wood inside, and there's a, a, a inflammatory reaction around that lesion. This is a patient who's underwent some sort of surgery, again, comes with a bump, and this was related to the suture itself. You could see some of those sutures on the CT scan, and this is an inflammatory sort of collection all around it, a suture granuloma. So in conclusion, I think soft tissue masses have a very nonspecific ultrasound appearance. Uh, High-frequency transducers do help us to get the echo pattern better. But I think the real clue is hidden either in the location or in the clinical history. It's really, really important to go, to, go into the history and, and see the physical appearance of these lesions. Ultrasound will remain a first-line modality before some other imaging is done in a lot of these one programs. So you'll keep seeing a lot of these, um, knowing the caveats that when you need to do further imaging is really important and not try to be a superstar of trying to make a very histopathological diagnosis on every one program. Thank you very much.